A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I'm so glad you're with me on the program today. We're going to be uh, turning our attention to what is going on with our uh, neighbors to the north up there in Canada, where, you know, the Trudeau administration instituted a, uh, don't call it a handgun ban, although that is kind of what it is. Uh, No, they call it a, a freeze. Basically trying to uh, stop uh, the vast majority of handguns from being sold in uh, Canada uh, while still uh, allowing existing owners to uh, maintain possession of at least to some of their handguns. So the uh, government is going through the, um, the orders that have been uh, enacted by the uh, Trudeau administration and... Uh, The gun control groups are arguing to uh, make these laws, as you can imagine, as restrictive as possible. We're going to get into this here in just a second. Before we do, though, let's talk about something that's going on here in the United States. Biden's America. It's crushing us. You've got companies laying off tens of thousands of workers one after the other. Americans working two jobs just to get by. Inflation pushing hardworking families to the brink. Just look at the price of lunch meat next time you go to the grocery store. And a digital dollar could be coming down the pipeline to completely destroy our way of life. The truth is, you need a plan. You know it, and I know it. And that's why you should call Gold Co. So you can diversify your savings and investments with gold and silver before things get worse. They're a six-time Inc. 5000 winner, 2022 Company of the Year. And with thousands of five-star reviews, they've helped people like you and me place over $1 billion in gold and silver. They're offering up to $10,000 in free silver while supplies last. And if you call them today, qualified callers will get a free Ronald Reagan half-ounce silver coin. So don't wait. Call Gold Co. at 855-412-3806 today. That's 855 412 3806. So, as I said, the gun control groups in Canada don't want anybody to own a handgun, right? And they don't have to worry about something like the Second Amendment. There is no right to keep and bear arms in uh, Canadian law. It is a privilege to be doled out by the state to whomever they deem fit uh, to possess a firearm, right? And according to the gun control activists, that would be uh, almost nobody, right? Maybe, maybe in the Northwest Territories or Nunavut, you can have, you know, a uh, bolt-action hunting rifle. But for goodness sakes, nobody needs a handgun. And in fact, in Canada, handgun ownership is already regulated to uh, basically those who use pistols for sport, which is one of the issues that has emerged here. Uh, Here's the headline. Don't broaden handgun freeze exception or exemption, firearm control advocates tell senators. Uh, Federal regulations aimed at capping the number of handguns in Canada. Now, in effect, the bill has measures that would reinforce the handgun freeze. Businesses can still sell to exempted individuals, including elite sport shooters who compete or coach in handgun events recognized by the International Olympic or Paralympic Committees. And gun control advocates, including the group Policy Souvent, said in a letter to Senate committee members studying the bill that expanding that exemption would put the interests of recreational sports shooters who want to buy new handguns ahead of public safety. Yeah. Again, if you want to continue engaging in your sport as a lawful gun owner, you can't. Because you, buying a handgun for sports, somehow might lead to more violent crime. Now, there's really no indication that uh, legal gun owners are driving violent crime in Canada any more than legal gun owners are driving violent crime here in the United States. But it's not about legal gun owners for the gun control advocates, right? It's about the guns. They don't really care if you're a legal gun owner or an illegal gun owner. They care that you own a gun. And if they're trying to ban handguns, well, they don't want anybody to own handguns. Uh, One of the uh, folks who testified against the current rules and uh, hoping to broaden the exemption for uh, sports shooters, uh, Jim Smith of the International Practical Shooting Confederation, he asked senators to widen that exemption to include IPSC competitors. Uh, Smith said, while the bill does not outright ban handgun ownership, the result for IPSC Canada is that as a sport, quote, we will see a slow demise as our athletes age when no new athletes are introduced and existing competitors' equipment wears out with them, unable to source replacements. 
Since the ban was introduced by order in council, we have already seen a slow decline in participation as new prospective members have been unable to purchase handguns. And again, this is not a flaw of the bill. This is by design. A handgun freeze, you know, it, it's very similar to what we've seen. Uh, actually, there was a, a New Zealand law that uh, New Zealand recently scrapped, by the way, but uh, they had changed the law a couple of years ago and said, basically, um, we're going to make it impossible for future generations to buy cigarettes, to buy tobacco, right? Uh, if you are born after such and such a date, you will not be able to purchase uh, tobacco when you become an adult. Now, so they scrapped that law <laughs> not long ago. Uh, because they need the tax revenue derived from uh, tobacco sales. But this is sort of the same thing, right? We're not going to institute a handgun ban. You existing handgun owners, you can still have them for now. But we don't want any new handgun owners. And so, yes, as gun owners age up and pass on, uh, the whole goal of this bill is that within a generation or two, handgun ownership in Canada will be virtually non-existent. Uh, it is a slow motion gun ban, but it is still a gun ban. Now, the gun control groups, as I said, uh, have objected to any uh, expansion of the uh, sports shooting exemption. Amending the bill to further broaden the Olympic exception uh, risks completely nullifying the freeze on new handgun acquisitions. Since Canadian law already essentially limits handgun purchases to target shooters. And a letter from a coalition of anti-gun groups. It would be akin, they say, to prohibiting new cars, except for drivers. Expanding the exemption would prioritize the interests of recreational sports shooters who want to buy new handguns over the lives of highly predictable future victims of gun violence. Well, again, that's only true if you can point to a wave of violent crime committed by sports shooters in Canada, which... You can't any more than you can point to a wave of violent crime in the United States committed by concealed carry holders or lawful gun owners, for that matter. Right. That's not the group of people who are committing violent crimes. Uh, just as in the United States, in Canada, you have a very small group of individuals who are well known to police who are committing a disproportionate amount of violence. And if you want to reduce that violence... You don't go after the people who aren't committing crimes. You go after the individuals who are. I mean, that's basic common sense. But again, this isn't about public safety. That's the stated purpose for all of these gun control bills, whether in the United States or in Canada. But the real purpose for all of these bills is not to make society a safer place. It is to disarm these citizens. Now, they may believe that uh, that will result in society becoming a safer place. I would point to, oh, well, I don't know, Washington, D.C. during its handgun ban, Chicago during its handgun ban. Um, how about the nation of Mexico, where there is one gun store and a homicide rate that is about five times that of the U.S.? Again, it doesn't, in the real world, this argument just doesn't amount to much. Because we see that these gun control laws impact folks who want to remain on the right side of the law, right? They don't want to commit a misdemeanor. They might be willing to do so as an act of civil disobedience, but they don't want to. They certainly don't want to commit a felony uh, for, um, in Canada, again, possessing a firearm in the United States for exercising a constitutionally protected right. So those folks are going to generally try to comply with whatever gun law you come up with. Now, the more restrictive the gun law it is, I say the less likely it is you're going to have that cooperation. But it's not about public safety. I mean, just look at California with all of the gun laws that they have on the books, right? You got the red flag law, you got the uh, assault weapons ban, you got the magazine ban, you got the 10-day waiting period, uh, you've got universal background checks, you've got the handgun roster, Right, So uh, unsafe handguns are not sold. You've got ammunition background checks. All of these gun control laws in place. And yet on a daily basis, you can still see stories about teenagers being caught with guns, mobs of armed robbers targeting victims in places like Oakland or San Francisco. Again, it's not legal gun owners who are driving this crime, whether in the United States or 
uh, in our neighbor to the north uh, up there in Canada. But I suspect that um, that exemption is not going to be expanded. Because again, the, the gun control groups are right about one thing. It does undercut the underlying intent of the legislation, which is to freeze the number of handguns that are available in Canada. And say, well, yes, uh, new sports shooters, uh, we don't want IPSC to die out, right? So uh, yes, you can uh, buy a handgun, you can compete in IPSC. That completely goes against what this bill was supposed to do. The gun control groups are right about that. Uh, and unless the Trudeau administration has a change of heart, and I suspect if that's the case, it would be because of politics, not because of any actual uh, real change within, right? Um, it just seems to me like they're likely to say, no, we're going to keep the uh, exemption as it is if you are Again, uh, training or participating in a, a sport recognized by the International Olympic Committee. Uh, sure, maybe you can have your you know high dollar competition pistol, but uh, other than that, uh, no, no guns, at least no handguns, and no quote unquote assault weapons because that's a whole different ball of wax here in Canada. But uh, no guns for you. Uh, we are going to, by the way, continue paying attention not only to what's going on up in Canada, but uh, the rest of the week we're going to be turning our attention to uh, what's going on in the northern United States. David Trayan from the uh, Sportsman's Alliance of Maine is going to be with us on Wednesday's Cam and Company. And they are hearing in uh, Boston today about 56 gun-related bills. Not all of them are bad, but a lot of them are bad. Uh, and there's another hearing taking place tomorrow. So we're going to be talking with the uh, folks from uh, the Gun Owners Action League in Massachusetts on Thursday. I spoke with Mike Harris uh, Monday afternoon and said, hey, do you want to come on the show? And he let me know, okay, listen, we got this going on. We got that going on. Why don't we hold off until later in the week? So I was going to have him on on Wednesday just talking about the uh, hearing that's being held today. But uh, we decided, now let's push it back another day because there is going to be more stuff to talk about. Uh, and unfortunately, they, you know, it is the time of year where we're starting to see uh, legislation introduced around the country. Bills, both good and bad, are starting to pop up. We talked with Philip Van Cleve of the Virginia Citizens Defense League yesterday about the uh, ban on so-called assault weapons that's been introduced in both the House and the Senate in Virginia. Um, so over the next couple of weeks, we probably will be talking to a lot of state level groups just to give you a sort of a lay of the land for 2024. What are some of the big gun control bills that are popping up? Uh, what are some of the good pro-Second Amendment uh, pieces of legislation that we might see enacted into law, including um, constitutional carry? I think we've got a very good shot at constitutional carry in Louisiana next year. That We've got a decent shot, at least on, on, you know, on paper, we've got a great shot at constitutional carry in South Carolina. You've got a Republican trifecta in the legislature, supermajorities in the state legislature. But the problem is that while the uh, state House has adopted constitutional carry by broad margins in the past, the state Senate has failed to do so. So I'm a little concerned about South Carolina. North Carolina, you've got the uh, the votes are there in the legislature, I believe, but uh, you got a governor who's going to veto uh, any uh, constitutional carry measure. And it remains to be seen whether or not Republicans want to make this a campaign issue in 2024. I think they should. I mean, if Democrats are running on a gun ban, let's run on the right to carry on the right. but. Uh, it remains to be seen whether or not Republicans in North Carolina will adopt that position. But those are just a couple of the uh, states we'll be taking a closer look at over the coming weeks. Right now, let's turn our attention to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. We'll start there. You know, I just mentioned we're going to be talking with David Tran from the uh, Sportsman's Alliance of Maine tomorrow. There's a lot of talk in Maine right now, obviously, after the uh, shootings in Lewiston about uh, expanding the state's gun control laws, right? Uh, replacing the yellow flag law with a red flag law. That's a huge priority for gun control advocates. They hate the fact that there is a mental health component uh, to Maine's yellow flag law. They hate the fact that law enforcement has to initiate these proceedings. It can't just be, you know, neighbor, acquaintance, somebody you ran into on the street. Um, they, they hate the due process protections that are a part of Maine's yellow flag law. So they want to replace... The yellow flag law with a red flag law, they, of course, are pushing for a ban on so-called assault weapons, uh, as well as, uh, quote-unquote, large-capacity magazines, 72-hour um, waiting period. Uh, that's another big push from the anti-gunners in Maine. And again, all of this based on the mass murders that were committed 
in Lewiston, right? By somebody who, by the way, would not have been impacted by the 72-hour hold. Uh, somebody who not only should have uh, been yellow flagged in Maine, but should have been prohibited under federal law from purchasing or possessing a farm because of his involuntary commitment to a mental health facility. They don't want to talk, you know, they want to use these murders to push for new gun control, but they don't actually want to take a look at what actually happened that allowed this individual to purchase a farm because then the issue becomes government failure, not a lack of legislation. And to that end, we get to today's deal of the day. The report comes from the Sun Journal newspaper in Lewiston, Maine. A Canton woman gets probation for straw purchases. You know, again, we're told that this is a very serious crime. We spoke with Larry Keene of the National Shooting Sports Foundation not long ago. NSSF and ATF doing a big campaign uh, in a, a couple of cities right now, focusing on the Don't Lie for the Other Guy program, right? If you commit a straw purchase and you buy a firearm for somebody who's not eligible to own one, you could be looking at 10 years in prison. And in theory, that's right. However, <clears throat> in reality, oftentimes it's a much different story. Caitlin Buck, 24 years old, pleaded guilty back in May to two felony counts of making a false and fictitious statement during the acquisition of a firearm from a licensed firearm dealer. Prosecutors say that Buck bought two 9mm pistols on September 14, 2021 from a FFL in Gray, Maine. That same day, she bought a 45 caliber pistol and another 9mm pistol from a licensed gun dealer in Lisbon Falls. Um, at both stores, she answered that she was the actual buyer of the guns when she was filling out the Form 4473. In March of this year, she met with federal agents and admitted that she had attempted to purchase the firearms on behalf of a man with money that he had given her. Uh, Buck's attorney, Robert Levine, wrote in court records that his client made the gun purchases to support her drug habit. At a party, she had met a drug dealer who sold Percocet. Levine wrote, the mention of drugs was enough to draw her interest. The two drank, smoked weed, listened to music. The man spent the night in the spare bedroom, left the next day, and the next time they met, he asked her to perform a straw purchase of firearms for him. In return, he offered her crack cocaine. On September 14th, he and his friend arranged to drive Buck to the two different gun shops to make the straw purchases of four pistols. The man she had met at the party gave her, quote, hits of crack before they left. Two more in the car, Levine wrote. She was under the influence by the time that they arrived at the first gun shop. By the way, this is her attorney saying that not only did she commit a straw purchase, but she also lied in the federal form about being an unlawful user of drugs when she bought the firearm. I, I, I guess stipulating to all of these things and asking for mercy, um, you know, were a part of Levine's strategy. And, and to be honest, it paid off. This week, U.S. District Court Judge Nancy Torrenson sentenced Buck to three years of probation for being a straw purchaser. Uh, she wasn't charged with being an unlawful user of drugs while she bought a firearm, but she could have been. Um, Levine said in March of last year, Buck talked to federal agents, fully cooperated, acknowledging her participation in the straw purchase and expressing both remorse and regret. She returned voluntarily to Maine after her indictment, stayed with friends after her arraignment. She entered a sober house in Lewiston where she spent three months, according to her attorney, moved back in with her mom, got a job, participated in group therapy, ended her relationship with her boyfriend, saying uh, her attorney said he was a constant source of stress, anxiety, and temptation. They had used drugs together since she was 21. She's now working at a nursing home in South Portland, Maine. Uh, Levine wrote that uh, Caitlin has grown and evolved through therapy, hard work, and abstinence from drugs, which is great. I'm glad to see that she's turned her life around, and I hope that she will take advantage of this gift that she's been given her. But none of that changes what she did. Now, it might, you you know, argue it, and clearly the judge believed, well, those are mitigating factors, right? Uh, both uh, the way that she was raised, uh, the uh, addiction to drugs, and maybe those were mitigating factors. But it doesn't change the fact that she broke the law. She engaged in this straw purchase. She did it for drugs. Now, we can talk about the evils of addiction. We can talk about the harm that is done by drug addiction, the, the need, again, for sobriety. And then maybe we don't want to put Caitlin Buck on the wrong path by sending her to prison when she started to get her life together. I, I can even understand that argument. 
But when you accept that argument and you give somebody like Caitlin Buck probation, what you are saying is that a straw purchase is not really that serious an offense. Now, there really shouldn't be consequences as long as you got your act together afterwards. And that I have a problem with. Again, we have this whole campaign, don't lie for the other guy. But apparently, if you can convince a judge that you lied for the other guy uh, because of your own personal state, but now your personal condition has improved, well, apparently you can lie for the other guy and get away with it with just a slap on the wrist, because that's what happened in Maine just a couple of days ago. Today's Armed Citizen story from Frisco, Texas, where a man has been arrested after being shot by the uh, homeowner he was trying to rob, according to police. Um, don't have a ton of information about this because it was so recent. It uh, happened uh, Sunday night. Officers in Frisco uh, called out about suspicious activity after a resident uh, told 911 that an unknown person had entered their backyard, pulled a ladder off of their home, and then broken a window with it. As officers were driving to the scene, they reported hearing gunshots. When they uh, got there, they secured the scene. They found 18-year-old Clinton Montgomery inside the home with a gunshot wound. Police said their investigation further revealed that Montgomery was attempting to enter the residence and apparently had already done so uh, when the homeowner shot him. And Montgomery was taken to a local hospital for treatment by the uh, doctors there. He uh, remains in custody. Uh, apparently at a, a local hospital, charged with burglary of a habitation and is a second-degree felony, earning a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison, as well as a, a $10,000 fine. Again, is Clinton Montgomery going to get 20 years in prison even if he's convicted for this? No, not at all. But uh, it appears that the homeowner, at least, was acting in self-defense and will not be facing any charges at all. Finally today, our good deed of the day, in the right place, at the right time, will unable to do the right thing, an armed citizen story of sorts, not involving a firearm, but a leaf blower. And you know what? It sufficed. It did the trick. Uh, this was in Connecticut. A Milford man now facing an attempted murder charge after police say he stabbed someone in the chest during a domestic violence incident. This happened on Saturday. Uh, one of the neighbors told News 12 in Connecticut that he struck the man, Kevin Conway, with a leaf blower when Conway refused to put the knives he was holding in his hands down. Uh, Todd Craig says he got within a couple feet of us. He had three knives chasing us, so I had to hit him with a leaf blower, and thank God I hit him right, and he got knocked out. Police reports say the victim was able to escape her husband, run outside for help. Craig says that's when he heard the screaming and then saw the victim running towards him. He said, I kept on begging him, put them down. Don't come in my yard. Put them down. It's not worth it. We can work this out. He just kept saying, she's going to die. I'm going to die. Craig said he was cutting his lawn using the leaf blower to, uh, you know, clear the leaves out when he saw the victim with a bloody shirt and a stab wound to her chest. Thankfully, she has recovered from injury. She's already out of the hospital. Thank goodness. According to police, there was an existing protective order in this case. It was not a full no contact order, um, but there was an order of protection in place at the time. Uh, the um, spokesman from the uh, Milford Police Department, Brian McDonald, Said, you know, if you or someone you know is a victim of domestic violence and you think that they're afraid to come forward, we urge people to just give us a call. In this case, Conway arraigned on Monday being held on a $750,000 bond. You know, I uh, wrote about a couple of uh, domestic violence incidents on Monday at Bearing Arms. In one case, a uh, woman who also had taken out an order of protection against her ex had to use a firearm in self-defense when her ex attacked her. There was another uh, terrible situation in Baltimore. Um, where a woman who had an order of protection out against her uh, soon-to-be ex-husband, she'd already filed for divorce, uh, he, uh, convicted felon, not allowed to legal possess a firearm, had told uh, police and the courts that he didn't possess any firearms, even though he'd been ordered to turn any of them that uh, he had in his possession over to uh, law enforcement. He showed up at her house with a gun. Uh, he was shot and killed by police, but not before she was shot and killed as well. So I second what um, Brandon McDonald said about being the victim of a domestic violence. If, if you are afraid to come forward, just reach out to somebody, to your local police, to the National Domestic Violence Hotline. But you don't have to be silent. And, you know, I, I said this in uh, my story yesterday, but I'm not discouraging anybody 
from obtaining an order of protection. Uh, th- those those things are there for legal purposes. They uh, will allow authorities to hopefully uh, go after somebody if they violate that order of protection. But please, please, please don't treat an order of protection like it's a suit of armor. Because for somebody who's willing to violate it, it is nothing more than a piece of paper. And it offers as much protection as a sheet of paper would. Um, if you are truly concerned about your safety, there are other things that you can do. It may, you know, we've talked to Nikki Gozer about this. And she says, you know, you may need to, to move. You may need to extricate yourself from that situation, try to hide. But you also should be, if you are in fear of your life, you should be prepared to protect it. That means obtaining a firearm, getting the training that you need so that you feel comfortable and confident using that firearm in self-defense if need be. Because we don't want to see tragic stories like this. And there is help available if you need to leave a bad situation. But you also have the right to protect yourself from somebody who wants to do you harm. Now, that is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program, as always. I'm looking forward to being back with you tomorrow again, talking with David Trayan from the uh, Sportsman's Alliance of Maine about the push for gun control post Lewiston. Uh, it should be a uh, fascinating conversation. And uh, David is a very bright guy, so I'm looking forward to uh, kicking off that discussion tomorrow. In the meantime, don't forget to check out BarryandArms.com throughout the day. We're keeping you up to date on all of the latest Second Amendment news and information from all across the country. And if you like what you see, I'd encourage you to become a VIP or VIP Gold member. All you have to do, go to BarryandArms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code GUNRIGHTS. You can get a significant savings on your VIP membership. As I was saying, thanks for showing your support. We're going to give you exclusive content you won't find anywhere else. News stories and analysis that matter. Just like your support, so thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your 2A Tuesday. I'll be on uh, Newsmax in the 5 p.m. hour uh, this afternoon talking about gun sales if you want to tune in. Otherwise, I'll see you back here tomorrow. Until then, be well, be safe, and be free.